Um, the part that I lead is specifically on electricity, and I'm going to do a little deep dive in four minutes and 30 seconds on the most exciting part of my research agenda. So it's a problem that affects 3.5 billion people, and no one really talks about it. Uh, but before I tell you what this problem is, I'm going to give you a little analogy. So remember when you were in undergrad and you had the atrocious flat chair, just the horrible flat that you were living in. Uh, it was probably really messy. Things were breaking. And you wrote to your landlord saying that, look, so-and-so needs to be repaired. And it turns out they never replied to you. Uh, and you know what? Tough luck. You signed a one-year tenancy agreement and, and you're locked in. Now, I want you to replace the landlord with fossil fuel companies and the tenants with 3.5 billion people on this planet. And instead of the one year tenancy agreement, think about 30 to 40 years. And now you'll start to comprehend what situation we're in because citizens across India, China, Pakistan, and Indonesia buy electricity that is backed by 25 to 40 year contracts with coal, oil, and gas companies. And the sad reality is that in most of these countries, solar and wind are now far, far cheaper than the coal and oil they source from. So climate change aside, this is actually making electricity far more expensive for half of the planet's population. And also because these contracts are legal instruments, as Ben will understand, this is very hard to exit. They've been written by extremely smart lawyers who know how not to break contracts. So part of our research agenda is um, to quantify the cost of this lock-in, just in pure monetary terms. In India, we find that solar is already three times cheaper than coal, and yet coal accounts for 80% of the generation and most of the customers are simply trapped. So if we can quantify the public benefit of switching, as Ben said, we can start to fight court cases. And in fact, this already happened in Delhi with a utility that represents 4.3 million customers going to court and saying, look, our 4.3 million customers are paying too much for electricity because solar is much cheaper and we can't exit. We want to provide more such evidence so that more such cases can be fought. We're doing some work in Pakistan where we've now got, through one year's worth of grueling effort, the universe of power purchase agreements that have ever been written in Pakistan. And we have found that the payments for expensive old generation are more than the health and education budget combined. Right, so... <laughs> I haven't even begun talking about CO2, <laughs> right? But on a cost basis, this is creating, this is turning up in the big numbers. So capacity payments for fossil fuel generation are one of the biggest contributors to Pakistan's debt on the national level. Okay, now the second part. For those who are into investment will know that your landlord wants you to sign an agreement because it would be a pain if their tenants move out every month. And it's actually not fair for them to look for a new tenant on a rolling basis. So what we need to do is we need to balance stability for the landlord versus flexibility for the tenants. Or in other words, stability for the investors in energy versus flexibility for the users of energy. And what we find by looking at these contracts in a lot of grueling depth is that they're completely lopsided. In the global South, they're multi-decadal on timescales that are not compatible with net zero at all. But more than that, the entire quantum of risk has been transferred away from the fossil fuel companies onto the utility that buys the power and hence the customers. Let me give you an example that applies to, um, I'm out of time, but I'll take 30 more seconds. But let me tell you an example that applies to India, Indonesia, and Pakistan. Every time the input of fuel goes up, 100% of that cost increase is passed on to the utility. So as the company, it doesn't matter if 
coal is more expensive or gas is more expensive, they can just pass that on. So there's no incentive to be efficient. There's no incentive to transition. You're not even exposed to the market. And on, with my last 20 seconds, I'll end on the note that not only is this a data collection and transparency sort of exercise, but we're also looking forward into the future because long-term contracts are how we're bringing renewables onto the market. And although we love renewables, I love solar, there might be a question down the line that 30-year contracts for renewables, are they striking the right balance between stability or inflexibility? Could there be an issue where 15 years down the line, there's some new vintage of some technology that's cleaner and cheaper, and we have the same sort of lock-in problem? Well, that's where you've got to strike a good balance between stability for investors and flexibility to accommodate technology change and dynamic efficiency. And so we want to apply that same logic to what's happening now to ensure that we don't kick the can down the road or recreate the same mistakes from the past. If you have any questions, find me later. Thank you so much.